So John Domstra works at AW Art Advisory, which is an advisory firm that assists collection, collectors to build and manage contemporary art collections. But he has a very diverse background. He's worked at galleries. He's also studied the history of art. He's worked on economics, mathematics, and at the International Monetary Fund. So. I'm very excited to welcome John Domstra here. Let's have a, a hand of applause, round of applause. I can't even speak anymore. It's the end of day one, but let's bring it up. Thank you, John. So this talk was born out of a paradox in that in the early years of global mass media, many artists engaging these new mediums look not to the future, but to traditional culture from pre-industrial times. So I want to unpack this tendency through three motifs, the art of uh, Nam June Paik, that of musician John Hassel, and the net art movement Vaporwave. Uh, Paik's 1973 video broadcast Global Groove, as Vuk helped contextualize, is con commonly cited as the seminal early example of video art, and that's a key document. But Global Groove was the product of many years of experimentation with video production, where Paik sought to render digital broadcasts and television images amenable to artistic manipulation and intervention. Uh, famously and most successfully, Paik worked with Japanese electronic engineer Shuya Abe to produce his famed video synthesizer, allowing him to craft a dizzying array of visual effects on screen. So Global Groove is then noteworthy, not simply for its technical achievements, but because the video is the most elegant crystallization of Paik's deeply utopian philosophy. His belief in the power of television and broadcast media to change the world and open up new horizons and productive avenues for artists, which would enrich culture more broadly. These lofty goals are encapsulated in a quotation from the essay, Global Groove and the Video Common Market, written in 1970. There, Paik said, if we could assemble a weekly television festival comprised of music and dance from every nation and disseminate it freely via the proposed video common market, uh, as we've mentioned, a sort of analog to economic market, its effects on education and entertainment would be phenomenal. Global Groove exemplifies this aim in two key scenes. One shows famous Korean dancer Sun Ak Lee performing a traditional fan dance accompanied by Korean music. In the background, the sweeping panorama of Midtown and Downtown Manhattan, as well as the Statue of Liberty are shown. The young woman is seen floating above the city like some angel or spirit. Using the synthesizer as well as studio techniques, Paik was able to superimpose multiple images together on one screen. These video fragments interacted along both spatial and multiple temporal dimensions. This represented a deep conceptual innovation over early experiments in montage, such as those by Sergei Eisenstein, that expanded considerably the scope of filmic juxtaposition. So in thinking of this scene's meaning, I think it's important to consider that Global Groove was produced roughly a decade after Paik's arrival as an immigrant in New York. So it can be seen as a touching moment of reflection on both his heritage and the creative community that fostered him, as well as a bold proof of concept of the collision between the traditional and the cultural vanguard through broadcast media. In the second key segment, Paik portrays a Navajo woman, Cecilia Sandoval, performing a plaintive chant and striking a drum. Her singing is interspersed by a reprise of the first sequence of Global Groove that shows two young go-go dancers dancing together, soundtrack to rock music. So the frequency of the cuts between the Navajo woman and the dancers accelerates as the two scenes sort of collide together. In each of these sequences, Paik stages an encounter between the primitive and the modern. Traditional folkways and musical forms are contrasted with metonymical symbols of modernity as represented respectively by the urban metropolis and even in a self-reflexive gesture, 
pigs own artistic output. Through form and content, the digital space is shown to be one where cultural traditions from societies at extremely different levels of economic and industrial development can interact with one another in a mutually reinforcing yet decidedly non-hierarchical manner. Roughly contemporaneously with Pig's experiments in television, other artists endeavored to meld the digital with long-standing cultural traditions. In music, I believe no figure epitomizes this tendency like trumpeter, composer, and electronic music pioneer John Hassel. Hassel was a central figure in American avant-garde music, collaborating with figures such as Terry Riley and Lamonte Young. We know that Charlotte Mormon was close with Lamonte Young as well, having performed his music in the 1960s as this concert flyer documents. So I think it's likely that Pagan and Hassel knew of one another, although I, I can't verify that. But either way, they spent formative years in a shared cultural matrix and milieu, and Peck and Hassel are uh, from the same generation. Uh, Hassel is, I think, uh, five years uh, younger than Peck. But Hassel was not confined to the downtown Manhattan art scene. He lived a peripatetic existence and traveled extensively throughout California, the American Southwest, as well as South America, the Caribbean, and later India. He studied for many years under Indian Raga practitioner Pandit Pran Nath, whom he would cite as his primary influence. This global sensibility is foregrounded in Hassel's first recorded album, Vernal Equinox, which was released in 1977. A glance at these tracks, Hex, Caracas Night, September 11, 1975, Blue Nile, and Vernal Equinox effectively communicate the themes that Hassel is aiming for in this record, a sort of mental descent into unexplored, tropical, atavistic, sonic landscapes. Much of the record's compositions are set against a relatively sparse instrumental background of droning notes from synthesizer or electric piano. The soundstage is accompanied by evocative percussive timbres from a variety of unique instruments drawn from many cultures, including goblet drum, mbira, and congas. Hessel also adds samples and field recordings, insects chirping, animals, rainfall, etc. Hassel's trumpet and his unique playing technique take center stage amidst the swirling field of evocative sounds. The trumpet is either slathered with electric distortion or played with a unique technique so that the trumpet has a muffled, buzzy, reedy sound, almost like a woodwind. So there's none of the bright timbres which so characterize the instrument in Western classical music of you know, Mozart, Beethoven, whatever. In describing his approach, Hessel explained that he, quote, was playing the mouthpiece, not so much the trumpet. I blow it like a conch shell, the most primitive, fundamental aspect to what I do. So even from a technical perspective, Hessel here is blending advanced technology with the most ancient and elemental ways of producing music. Vernal Equinox found an influential admirer in Brian Eno, a former member of British rock band Roxy Music, who was, at the time, working in Manhattan with the art rock group The Talking Heads. After Eno and Hassel met, they began to collaborate and produce music together. The album they released, which was credited to both artists, was titled Fourth World Volume 1, Possible Music, and was stylistically very similar to Vernal Equinox, although Eno added more electronic textures. But importantly, the title, Fourth World, would become Hassel's mission statement and encapsulation of his musical philosophy. He described Fourth World as a, quote, interbreeding of the first technological and third traditional world influences in a way that aspires to be both metaclassical and metapop. A decade after the release of this record, in the early 1990s, 
He expanded on this philosophy in an interview with composer and journalist David Toop. He said, quote, possible musics, possible cultures, possible lifestyles, etc. This is an idea that boils down to the range of possible relations between individual, tribe, and nation in the mass electronic age. I would like the message of the fourth world to be that things shouldn't be diluted. This balance between native identity and global identity via various electronic extensions is not one that can be dictated or necessarily predicted. One should be very humble and informed by the way things used to be in smaller numbers. It becomes important to look towards smaller cultures to develop a modus operandi for a new age, not a capital N, capital A, new age. I think this quote is important to you know, read at length and consider in full because it so crystallizes the similarity between Pig and Hassel's view on technology and art, which was one of hybridity, not the modern, overtaken the past, and you know, informed both by traditional musical uh, styles. But if we fast forward nearly 20 years after the widespread adoption of the internet, we can see that the most utopian predictions of Pig and Hassel have largely failed to pass. Although the internet has allowed artists to easily communicate, exchange ideas, and publish their work without traditional intermediaries such as galleries or record labels, it also could be said that this surplus has paradoxically created a world that is more hostile to art. We're bombarded by messages, images, and face the colonization of the personal life by the professional. It's increasingly hard to be absorbed in and stilled by a single work of art, let alone find the time to explore deeply the art of different cultures as Paik and Hassel had wished. Vaporwave was a musical genre that was born of the internet and arose in the early 2010s out of these disappointments. Uh, it was a truly global mu movement promulgated primarily by young amateur musicians, mostly based in the United States, Europe, and East Asia. Through both oral and visual media, vaporwave artists crafted enigmatic vignettes that referenced the 1980s and 1990s, an era contemporaneous with the birth of consumer computing technology and the early years of internet culture. It congealed ultimately into a unique retro-futuristic style and an attempt to recapture the early multicultural utopianism that the net offered. So in describing the music sound, it's an electronic genre that relied heavily on sampling, the employment of pre-recorded music or sound effects. With the tournament as their primary strategy, vaporwave musicians plundered discarded, kitschy pieces of musical ephemera, again from the 80s and 90s. They focus primarily on American and Japanese music, pop music, smooth jazz, advertisement jingles, music, and these sounds were then soaked in reverb, pitch shifted and slowed to the point where they were barely recognizable, registering as soupy, narcotized tones that skirted the boundary between melody and ambient background music. And the accompanying album covers also are striking visual documents that cemented Vaporwave's unique aesthetic, mirroring the uncanny, alienated effect of its music and helping delineate its animating concerns. This album, Floral Shop, uh, by an artist who goes by the name Macintosh Plus, uh, was a sort of seminal early um, Vaporwave album, and I think it really captures the sort of postmodern style where there's the bust of Helios and a low-res tropical cityscape uh, sort of juxtaposed in a, a digital background. So in thinking of other uh, themes vaporwave artists employed, one motif was obsolete technology. The album cover, Computer Death by San Diego-based musician Infinity Frequencies features a vintage CRT monitor and on it, on the screen is displayed a literal ghost in the machine, the wire outline of a face. So this imagery reveals the general aim of Vaporwave, which is straightforwardly surrealist, to endow the outmoded with a mystery and depth. Relatedly, other digital spaces are depicted, like those from the video game Second Life, The Sims, or other Nintendo 64 video games. 
The employment of these obsolete, rudimentary graphics dovetails with the wistful, enigmatic music and keys the genre to the space of regression and fantasy. A final key theme is the employment of East Asian imagery. There is a particular fondness for the aesthetic of Hiroshi Nagai, who was one of the key illustrators of Japanese album art in the 1980s. Nagai's aesthetic had defined the Japanese musical genre of city pop, which itself was Japan's take on the boogie album-oriented yacht rock coming from the United States. So the employment of Nagai's style sort of functions like an Ouroboros of transcultural influence, appropriation, reappropriation from the West to the East and back again. Alternatively, there was an interest in cyberpunk noir landscapes as the album cover for uh, Birth of the New Day by the musician 2814 typifies. Uh, it looks like a digital reinterpretation of the city from Ridley Scott's movie Blade Runner. So the imagery presented tends to be Japanese interpretations of California or Hawaii, or American interpretations of Tokyo or Hong Kong. The world presented in these visual documents is imaginative, escapist, and rendered in the aesthetic of Japanese anime. It takes the form of an imagined pan-cultural Pacific sphere, an East meets West ideal that mirrors the early multicultural utopianism of artists like Paik and Hassel. Vaporwave explores digital culture, both material culture and the ephemeral, through themes of memory and nostalgia, alienation, and psychoanalytic regression. And these ideas are then routed through an East Asian visual idiom. While Paik and Hassel's art has a forward-looking optimism, there is a retrospection and wistfulness in Vaporwave. Though its practitioners were largely untutored, they surfaced what I hope to have demonstrated as a key dialectic, that between the exotic, the other, and the pre-modern, which lurks in the unconscious of the global network. Global society will continue to march through new digital horizons, of course, which will be distributed unequal, unequally, and will face additional challenges. The technical infrastructure of the internet itself, while often invisible, you know, the servers uh, landscape uh, is uh, exacerbating climate change. And digital albums are also streamlining discourses, leveling differences. As we confront these challenges, it is comforting to remember the radical utopian promises that informed informed many of the early artists and theorists of global mass media, and those who have come since who have found those promises, yet un unconsummated, moving, and urgent. Thank you.